It's like a USB stick going into a kid. Like, whatever <laughs> they got in them is about to come onto you, it's, demon wise. So- <laughs> wow. You're jizzing out demons, just admit it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Taylor, and on this channel, we discuss life and relationships after leaving the church and do some commentary on the goings on in evangelical Christianity. Today, we're talking about a relatively new Christian podcast called Girls Gone Bible, as bizarre as it sounds. This podcast is a play on the 90s TV show Girls Gone Wild that's best known for the show's participants lifting up their shirts and flashing the camera. When I first stumbled on this podcast, I genuinely could not decide if it was just like a grift. Not only is the podcast branding rather salacious, but both hosts are working actors. One of the podcast hosts, Angela Halili, has even had a small role called Beautiful Woman Number 1 in the miniseries Welcome to Chippendales, and this was as recently as 2022. For those of you who don't know, Chippendales is an all-male touring dance troupe known for its striptease performances. There is absolutely nothing inherently wrong with her involvement with this show, but I do find it strange since she's also devoted an entire episode of her podcast in 2023 to talking about the importance of modesty for Christian women. It just seems like she's either adopted some of her conservative Christian views rather quickly or there's something a little more suspicious going on there. At the end of this video, I'll circle back to whether or not I think this podcast is a grift, but before that, I'd like to do a mini deep dive on Girls Gone Bible, the women behind it, and react to some of their content. I'm calling this a mini deep dive because their podcast has only been out for about a year. So honestly, there's not that much information out there about it. So Girls Gone Bible is a Christian podcast that according to its YouTube bio is about all things Jesus and all things life. I've watched quite a few episodes and it's nothing special. There's literally hundreds of identical Christian podcasts out there that cover the same topics. That's not to say, though, that they don't have some shocking things to say. They absolutely do. One of their most egregious claims is that mental health can only be cured by God. Their podcast also does pretty well. In less than a year, they've amassed over 300,000 subscribers and on average get between 80,000 and 100,000 views. Not too shabby for two women who don't really have anything to say that hasn't already been said in evangelical spaces. The podcast is hosted by Angela Halili and Arielle Reitzma, two actresses living in Los Angeles. First, let's talk about Angela. Angela is 28 and is an Albanian American actress and model. Aside from Welcome to Chippendales, probably the two most prominent productions Angela has starred in was an episode of American Horror Stories and the movie The Space Between alongside Kelsey Grammer. According to IMDb, she's also starring in an upcoming horror film called Spin the Bottle. It's about a group of teenagers in small town Texas who unleash a deadly force after playing the famous game in an abandoned house where a grisly massacre once took place. Attention Hollywood people! The whole angsty high school friend group messing around with malevolent spirits in an abandoned house trope like has been played out. Let, let's move on. Who am I kidding? I'm probably gonna go see it. I mean, it's a horror movie and it has Justin Long in it, so. <laughs> anyway, according to various Reddit users, Angela used to date Matt Reif. Yep, the same Matt Reif who opened his Netflix special by joking about domestic abuse and then after the public was rightly offended, posted a link to a special needs helmet and said it was his apology. I really can neither confirm nor deny that she used to date Matt Reif because the only information I could find about their relationship came from Reddit, and we all know how reliable Reddit can be. Now on to Angela's partner in crime, Arielle Reitzma, who prefers to be called Ari. 
Ari is 34 and is an actress and model originally from Massachusetts. Ari has starred in an episode of How I Met Your Mother and has also had some minor roles in various movies, including Rock of Ages, Don John, and American Satan. From what I can tell, Ari, despite being older, is something of Angela's protege. They've mentioned several times on their podcast that Ari has only been a full-fledged Christian for about a year which is only a little bit longer than their podcast has been around. I'm not gonna lie, um, it's pretty obvious on the podcast that Ari is fairly new to this whole Christian thing. I'm not saying this to pass judgment, but rather to just state a fact. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns. Hymns. And hymns. The name Halloween traces back to, what is it? Ca ca Catholicism? Where is, is that? How you pronounce Catholicism. it? Catholicism. Okay. The name Halloween traces back to Catholicism. Cath <laughs> According to the first episode of their podcast, Angela and Ari first met each other on a job, and I'm assuming this means they first met each other on the set of some type of production. Ari was going through some really difficult things at the time, and Angela comforted her while she cried. I was just sitting there sobbing, and all of a sudden I look over, and there was Ange. And she sat with me and she just held my hand and she was like, Are you, first of all, what's your name? And I said, Ariel. I said, I'm so sorry. I am just having the worst day. And she held my hand and she said, look at me. She's like, we are going to get through this together. And in that moment, I was like, this is going to be my friend forever. Like, I just knew. And she held my hand and yeah, you were just, she sat with me for an hour and you were just so selfless and you helped me through that. And then how was it after that? I'll be real, their friendship seems really genuine and pure. They're constantly telling each other how much they love each other and value their friendship. And I really think that's amazing. In a lot of ways, they remind me of me and my best friend. But unlike Angela and Ari, we don't base our friendship off of sharing the same religious views, but off of mutual trust, respect, and simple enjoyment of each other's company. According to her testimony, Angela grew up Catholic, but didn't really cultivate her relationship with God until she started struggling with anxiety and alcoholism in her early 20s. One of her mentors at the time asked her to start reading the Bible and after she started doing this and also praying regularly, she finally found some healing. Let me tell you guys, it was not by my own might. It was not by my strength. That's why I really believe that's the day that I was saved because I didn't have like an encounter with Jesus like some people have. That was just the first day where I knew he went into my heart. He took the desire to drink. He went into my brain. He rewired it because it's not normal to like go through that and then not need any type of like program or help or therapy. I didn't do any. I literally just stopped. Mm. He delivered me. That's what deliverance is. One day he Absolutely. decided and and it's because I fell to my knees and I surrendered and I was like, that's it. Me and you. I give it to you for real this time. I'm very glad that Angela found healing and if Christianity was the tool she used to find it, I'm not gonna fault her for that. However, as we'll see later on, Angela and Ari preach that God is the only way to address issues like mental health and addiction. That was the moment, that was truly the moment where I said, okay, now, it, now I'm scared. Now my emotional state being is becoming physical. I'm truly getting sick. I need to change yeah. my life now. And we can't do that without the power of Jesus. There is not a friend, not a parent, not a therapist that can heal you. Only Jesus can. Yeah. Just because something worked for you doesn't mean that's what everyone else must do. And also, evidence-based methods of addressing mental health work far better than faith-based methods. Ari apparently also grew up Catholic, which I find really interesting considering she didn't know how to pronounce the word Catholicism. Catholicism. Like Angela, she found God after going through a rough patch in her life where she said that she tried to find her identity and things like money, relationships, and her career. It was funny. I would, I would 
call my friends all day. I would go to therapy and I would just constantly look for things to, to heal me, but it wasn't until I really found God, until I found true peace. As far as I can tell, the only like real scandal they've been involved in happened last year when their followers started calling them out for wearing scandalous outfits while simultaneously pushing conservative Christian viewpoints. According to the New York Post, their followers started commenting under their Instagram posts and uh, one of the comments said, it's shameful for you to represent Jesus Christ in this manner. Um, another one said, look at these lust provoking photos. It's about you and you are using my Lord for your personal gain. And then there was also a Reddit user in the LA influencer snark subreddit that had the following to say, what put me off was that she has a podcast about modesty, but still posts thirst traps with naked stomach or thirst trap videos. Had she not made the podcast about modesty, I wouldn't comment here. But as her follower, I feel used to make her money as if she doesn't mean what she says. Some of their followers have defended them by saying that they're still learning and growing and that as Christians, we shouldn't be the first ones to cast stones. Of course, I don't think there's anything wrong with the outfits they used to wear or still wear. That being said though, their podcast from the beginning has been geared toward evangelicals and conservative Christians. So I do find it strange they posted photos of themselves that would undoubtedly alienate this same demographic. Not only that, but it seems like they didn't really start to change their wardrobe until their followers pointed out the inconsistency. I take photos. I'm an actress, Ari's an actress and a model. Um, we both have Instagrams, taking photos and doing photo shoots and stuff like that is a part of our job. Um, yeah, look, we, we, that's the thing with you and I. I mean, we're learning every single day. And look, we understand with our platform that we have, we need to do right by you guys. And we do not want to be ignorant. Mm -hmm. We want to glorify God and we can't just talk the talk. We have to walk the walk. Yeah. And you and I talk a lot about that. So um, this is a new journey for you and I that we are learning every single day. And we're also like, you know, you're like, Ari, is this okay? I don't know. And here's the problem with evangelical spaces, and I'm sure Angela and Ari have already experienced this, but nothing you wear will ever be modest enough for some Christians. The concept of modesty comes from purity culture. It's based on this backward idea that you're responsible for the thoughts and actions of other people simply by existing in your body. Modesty within Christianity is ever-changing, and despite some Christians claim that modesty is based on some objectivity, it's really subjective. So Angela and Ari need to understand that if they are going to tackle this subject, it's always going to be an uphill battle. Okay, so now that we have some of their background info out of the way, I do want to react to a few clips from their YouTube channel. And as a disclaimer, these clips are part of larger episodes. I've tried to do my best to make sure we're not taking them out of context, but do bear that in mind as we watch and react. I'm also gonna bring Drew on to react with me because it's just more fun that way. And I know we all appreciate his insights when it comes to content like this. So let me give you a little bit of background information on okay. this podcast episode. In this episode, they're discussing Halloween and whether or not Christians should celebrate it. They discuss how the holiday is connected to the Celtic fe festival Samhain, which they mispronounce like sa Samhain or something like that. Okay. They say that because Halloween has pagan roots, it's bad. I also want to note that in the middle of this video, they start talking about Israel and it's almost placed as an ad. It comes off really propagandized. It looks like they're reading off of a script. They're pro-Israel and believe Israel has a right to defend itself by brutally murdering innocent Gazans who are mostly children in order to protect itself from Hamas. Yeah. It was really weird. It really seemed like an ad. It, it, they read it like they huh. re read their sponsorships. I wonder if they got it from somebody else, like a producer of the show or something like that, because they were like, oh, we want to you know, hop on the bandwagon of supporting Israel, even though we don't understand the situation. Maybe, and so yeah. get something for us to read to, to, to do that. Yeah, they were 100% reading a script, mm. for sure. Okay. 
I don't like the idea of going to a Halloween party. Mm -hmm. I just think that there's too much darkness. The veil between the living and the dead is supposedly open. I just don't think... I think it's good to go to bed early that night and wake up the next morning. You know what I mean? I just... I don't know. I just... I don't like the ritual of going out and getting drunk and celebrating darkness like that. Yeah, I think... I mean, I I hear you on that. I have a little bit of a different take on that. I mean, after studying really what Halloween is and all the witchcraft, it's one of the biggest days of the year with witchcraft and stuff, it it really does freak me out because I – witchcraft just – ugh. But um, (laughs) I think you do – you can do everything in a tasteful way, right? Mm -hmm. We have a group of friends and we're not – we're honoring God by the way we dress. And, you know, you have a a party with your friends and you, you you know, have some fun. I – I don't know. I just think I don't see the harm in it. I, that's that's just my personal opinion. If yeah. you, I don't think you should be dressing up as demons and devils oh, with blood not. coming down your chin and going to Hollywood parties. No, I would say absolutely not. But if you're having just a fun little party with friends and let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about <clears throat> let's talk about scary stuff let's talk about because I just had to go into a Halloween shop and I will literally never go in one again it was so scary the scary mask the scary faces the blood the death this is the issue is anything because I do agree I think I think personally that you can dress up in a costume put on some ears and some do whatever you want and then be surrounded by people who aren't worshiping the devil and who aren't partaking in weird stuff or doing rituals or witchcraft any of that stuff you know what I mean I think I do I do think that you and I can have a couple people over and wear costumes and we're not celebrating the devil or anything like that now when it comes to scary stuff and like gory stuff I don't believe we're so big on symbolism and we're so big on like we won't even wear like a t-shirt with a skull on it. Skulls and a lot of people, there's a lot of debate about skulls because people think, well, skulls, it's just the human body. Skulls represent death and Jesus represents life. And so we have life through (laughs) Jesus. We don't need to be glorifying death. We don't need to be glorifying evil and darkness. And so that's where I really draw the line hard. And there, there is no opinion in that. Like you cannot be dressing up as anything scary, anything demonic, anything dark. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with you on that. Um, yeah, we have to live in the light, not the darkness. Yeah. Yeah symbolism is huge and I and it's we see it everywhere yeah. Angela and I you know we live in LA and we'll be driving and I'm not kidding you on every single bus on every single sign everywhere is that um, exorcist movie is the exorcist movie everywhere it's we driving look, me nuts it's awful I used to love horror movies. Did yeah. you did you like horror movies growing I, up? I love them. I've been in them. I've been I really yeah. am having a lot of revelation. Same. I have a lot of different <laughs> thoughts about this. I mean, I first of all, I feel like it's a little bit strange that the one girl is saying like you can't dress up as anything scary, nothing like horror themed or gory or you know, nothing with skulls or blood or anything like that. Yeah. But she's also been in horror movies before. Like, she's going to be in an, an, a horror movie coming out in, like, later this year. Or, really? Yeah, called Spin the Bottle. What? Yeah, yeah she's... it's it, And it very much feels like do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Because it's like, okay... It's okay when you when you're making money. It's okay. You can't even wear a shirt with a skull on it, but you can be in a horror movie that has a, even kind of a sexually suggestive title. I don't know. How does that make any I sense? I mean, it could be that she was cast in this movie before she started getting really, really conservative about her Christian beliefs. But it's still, it's just like it really just does feel like. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Like it's okay for me to do this when I'm getting paid. Yeah. But everyone else that's watching, don't do it. We've heard a lot of Christians talk about how they're big on symbolism mm-hmm. and you must flee from these types of symbols because they invoke this and they do this. And that's one thing. But honestly, hearing her talk about like, I'll never go into a Halloween store again. It was just so about death and evil. And it's just hard for me to get over the idea that someone who's an adult actually believes that toys and props and decorations Mm -hmm. and drawings, aka symbols, 
have inherent, intrinsic, and transcendent properties that will affect you in mm -hmm. tangible ways. Yeah. Not that symbols are, you know, products of our minds. They are tools of communication. Yeah. It makes me want to ask them, do you think that you could actually look into this scientifically and find that people who use these symbols somehow are affected by them psychologically, you know, negatively? Is there a tangible result to associating with or going into Halloween stores? Or are these things just tools that can be used in any particular way, good or bad? I, I think even if you could run an experiment on that and, you know, obviously it would show that no. Yeah. They would say, well, but it's spiritually harmful. Yeah, the whole bit about the veil between the real world and the spiritual world being so thin on that night, that's that's a long-standing superstition that has just as much root, as far as I'm aware, in non-Christian ideas and celebrations as in Christian thought. Yeah. Now, Halloween isn't actually completely pagan. It's mm -hmm. not. There are Christian versions of Halloween. Yeah. And uh, even uh, Christian apologists like Inspiring Philosophy have made videos about this being like, Christians, you can celebrate holidays. Like, stop yeah. freaking out about everything being pagan. It's not. And yeah, I mean, he's he's right. Well, and I think also the thing is, is that does Halloween have like pagan roots or roots in other cultures' holidays? Yeah. Yeah. So does every single holiday. Yeah. Because like traditions and holidays don't exist in a vacuum. Right. As uh, culture expands, they're going to be influenced by the surrounding people groups or cultures, and they're going to incorporate some of their traditions into their current traditions. That's just like sociology. That's how it works. Yeah. There's no like purely Christian holiday. Or purely pagan holiday. Yeah. Right. Like that's that's how history and how, <laughs> how people work. Right. A lot of cultures have holidays that specifically mark the change in season. So oh, there's yeah. a lot of holidays around fall. There's a lot of right. holidays around winter and spring. That's, that's just very common. I, I think another thing that I thought was really weird is that, you know, she's saying like, I don't want to wear anything that's like celebrating death, but then they'll wear crosses. <laughs> which is literally an uh, instrument yeah. of torture. torture yeah but that's okay yeah but other like symbols of torture are things that could be scary bloody gory like yeah. that's not okay for some reason yeah i mean christianity as we've talked about in previous videos does rely upon kind of jewish traditions of blood magic mm -hmm. which is if you utilize the blood of like say an animal in judaism it's always an animal then it can cleanse wrongdoing, cleanse sin. And then Jesus kind of was seen by Christians as being the ultimate blood sacrifice in the style yeah. of Judaism. It's just, it was the perfect, the perfect well, man. They actually God's son. talk about that exact thing. Yeah. But I mean, but isn't that celebrating death and damnation and destruction and, and all of these spooky, scary things? But Jesus gives us life. So I okay. get, which makes up for the spooky scariness. So it's not all about symbolism. It is about outcomes. In that specific case. <laughs> yeah. I do really want to ask them if they actually think there is some sort of literal substance to the veil that is separating the paranormal spooky world from the real world. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like they think that, you know, witchcraft, ugh. It's very, very real to them. But it, have they ever looked into it beyond the symbolism? Do they know more about it than doubt, just the symbolism? I highly doubt it. Yeah. I highly doubt it. I also want to talk about when she was talking about seeing the uh, billboards for the Exorcist movie. And I'm assuming that she's – like when this was filmed, I think Exorcist Believer was yeah. about to come out. Which, and you know, she's like, oh, the exorcist, like, that's so spooky, scary. Like, I'm just going to look at it and get, like, demon possessed or something. And I think it's really interesting because you've read The Exorcist Effect by Joseph Laycock. And mm -hmm. I'm actually right now in the middle of reading it. Yeah. 
And uh, one of the things that they talk about is that The Exorcist was kind of like a religious movie. And it was actually like marketed and targeted towards like Christians, yeah. specifically Catholics. Right. And it really, that movie really shaped how uh, Christians think about things like exorcism and demonic possession. Mm -hmm. the, the book talks about how, you know, our society's religious beliefs can influence art or movies mm -hmm. and books. And then in turn, movies and books kind of shape religious beliefs. Yeah. So some of the religious thinking around demonic possession and exorcisms and stuff like that has more to do with like horror movies yep. than it does with like anything that's like traditionally like Christian. Yeah, I guess. Absolutely. Um, I wrote down uh, a quote from the book. The exorcist emerged as a Catholic rebuttal to Rosemary's baby. Um, there's three different horror movies uh, that are referred to in the book as the unholy Trinity. It's uh, Rosemary's baby, the exorcist and the omen. Right. Rosemary's baby came before the exorcist. And at the end of that movie, you know, it's very nihilistic. Satan ends up winning. Yeah. And the exorcist was kind of like a religious like rebuttal to that because the exorcist is a, about God kind of um, prevailing. Preva over e yeah. Prevailing over evil. And it's about goodness. Yeah. So it's like, it's kind of like pro Christianity. Right. Right. <laughs> and I wrote down in Rosemary's baby, Satan wins and the Catholic priest who worked with the author who wrote the exorcist um, while he was, was writing the book, wanted to remind the public that Satan and the devil exist, but d God can triumph over evil. Mm. And I also wrote down another quote, the idea that demonic evil suggests the possibility of a merciful God, even the even in the face of scientific skepticism, is an important theme of The Exorcist and part of what makes it a good novel. At the time, there was a lot of fear of like skepticism kind of taking over or like there being like less religiosity yeah. among people. And that kind of caused a lot of anxiety where people weren't really sure what was going to happen if yeah. God wasn't protecting them from the devil anymore. Yeah. And so the exorcist kind of like reminded people like, yeah, these things exist, but God's still there and God's still going to take care of us. Right. Yeah. Ironically, if you actually look at the tangible, potentially measurable outcomes of the exorcist specifically, not the new one, but the original movie in, in the 70s, we see that religious devotion seemed to actually increase yeah. as a result uh -huh. of it, and specifically Christian religious devotion, yeah. specifically paranoia, fear, spiritual preparedness mm. for uh, the demonic. Right, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people that went to go see The Exorcist felt like they were being like exorcised themselves and mm -hmm. thought that they would, were possibly possessed. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like there was a lot of like reports of people going to the hospital because they thought that they were losing their minds and stuff. Yeah, like it really, really like kind of sparked this uh, belief and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, really. Without Christianity, the exorcist stuff doesn't really have teeth or make sense. Mm -hmm. It's it's really in light of people's belief in Christianity that these movies have power right yeah. uh, i think that for us these movies were really really terrifying yeah. when we were uh, christian yeah. this type of movie was like this type of horror movie was the type that i was like the most scared of yeah yeah i i almost couldn't even watch movies that had not almost i couldn't watch movies that had exorcisms in them or demons in them because i thought that could open up a doorway for it. Yeah. And then after I watched the movies, I'd be really, really scared. And I couldn't tell maybe my fear was because a portal was opened up, the veil had been yeah. made thin, or I'd invited something, whatever. And some of my teenage experiences of just pessimism, fear of, about growing up, I did kind of wrap in demonic mm -hmm. language at certain times. Now that I'm older... I kind of watch these movies point and laugh and feel no negative effects from them. Yeah. I don't even have the paranoid, like, look over my shoulder the same way that I yeah. had. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, they still definitely scare me, but I would not say that, like, you know, I'm going to bed at night, like, worried that there's a demon in the corner of my room or right. something. But that whole, like, you know, just watching the movie can open a door to the demonic. Wasn't that idea kind of originated from, like, a horror movie, too? Like, didn't that come from, like, Poltergeist? Yeah. Or, like, just the idea that, like, inanimate objects could be possessed I think that the idea within American culture and pop culture and pop Christianity like this, that specifically media could open that door, Mm -hmm. was something that came from influences like Poltergeist. I'm sure there's more to it, and I may be forgetting some things that Joe said in The Exorcist Effect. But yes, things like Poltergeist absolutely had an effect on the American, you know, psyche surrounding that that issue and i think also that came from uh, specifically the exorcist but a lot of horror movies that followed it will like drum up speculation that the like production of the movie was cursed Mm -hmm. and they'll like do that on purpose because having that like controversy gets more people to go and actually watch the movie yeah and also the whole like based on true events thing a lot of the time these movies are like super loosely based on true events like the exorcist was loosely based on true events but just saying this is based on true events gets people like super interested in going to watch right if it weren't for christians getting so afraid of these movies without any real evidence then these marketing tactics would would not not work work. Mm -hmm. so it's really people i think like girls gone bible that are drumming up attention and excitement even for things like exorcist believer yeah i mean also like my question to them would be if you guys are christians you believe that jesus has got your back you're you're already covered you're protected from demonic influence i think so then why are you concerned about like dressing up as something gory or like just seeing a billboard for a horror movie, like you're already protected from that. Yeah. So like, why do you have to do extra steps? Right. I have a hypothesis for one factor that might influence their uh, fear Hmm. of that. And the idea that knowing Jesus and being a a Christian isn't enough to protect you just in itself. It's not in movies. It's Christians that are like regularly attacked. I mean, an exorcist believer yeah there are christians little bit of a spoiler here i'm not saying who (laughs) but there are christians who are directly killed by demons yeah so i think that that spreads this idea that christians are vulnerable yeah maybe there are extra steps to cover up our our vulnerability there yeah that's a good point okay so some background on this next clip we're gonna watch They talk about how since both of them came to know Jesus through their mental health struggles, that they want part of their ministry to be helping others with their mental health issues by looking at the Bible and upholding the Bible as an authority on mental health. Ari talks about how when she was struggling with mental health, she was watching a lot of stuff about New Age, manifesting, and tarot card reading. And they believe that kind of stuff can destroy your mental health because you're putting it above God. And I I do want to mention like this episode of their podcast was super triggering for me to watch because Angela, she's dealt with a lot of um, like anxiety um, and alcoholism too, which I haven't struggled with, but the anxiety I have like very much struggled with. And the way she was describing it was like exactly like my experience. Mm -hmm. But then she follows it up with the only thing that helped me and cured me was God. Right. She didn't do any therapy or any medications or anything. Just God. Great. And I'm like, you know, I've tried that. I've tried the whole God thing. Didn't really help me that much. Yeah. The only the thing that helped me is therapy and medication. Evidence based. Evidence based treatment. So, yeah, it was a bit of like ugh, triggering for me. We're gonna talk a lot about authority today, but the more obedient that I am to God, the more submitted that I am in every area, especially in sin and in the areas that will bring spiritual warfare. The less hard it is on this area when I'm not living right or with God or by the word of God this I am more vulnerable in these areas these are my weaknesses we have to be aware of our weakness 
So by these areas, she's talking about mental health. I right. just want to make sure that's clear. It says, this is mine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so when I'm not right with God, this area gets attacked. Mm. So it's just the closer <laughs> I am to him, the better we do. But I also don't want it to say, because you could be really close to Jesus and still have strongholds on your life. You could be really close to Jesus. So I don't want you to be discouraged being like, I'm doing everything right, but I'm still dealing with this. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I know that strongholds are a thing. I know that deliverance is real. And I know that at the same time, you can be delivered from things. We have a genetic predisposition. Things are passed down. Things are in our biological makeup that is passed down from our parents and their parents. And I know that this is something that I've seen in generations before. Um, but daily prayer and submission to God about it. Yeah. So, I mean, this confuses me because she's basically saying that, you know, if you're living in sin or if you're not trusting God enough or not doing what you need to be doing as a Christian, that that can contribute to your mental health not being good. Mm -hmm. But then she also says you can be doing all of the things right. You can be trusting in God and doing all the things you're supposed to do. And your mental and health your mental can still, still be bad. Still be bad. And she acknowledges that some people have genetic predisposition to it. So I'm like, why heap on this? Well, you're not trusting God enough if you're if you're still struggling with your mental health. I mean, to me, that yeah. comes off as very like victim blamey. Yeah, because it's like because she can turn around to somebody who's like having a hard time and being like, well, it's because you're you're not reading your Bible every day. Yeah, I mean, it is a way that she can say that her belief system gets credit for all the wins yeah and it doesn't get any blame for the misses mm -hmm. it's not a fair system yeah yeah because if like you're you're doing well if your mental health is well is good then god did it right <laughs> if your mental health isn't good god didn't do it <laughs> right i do want to point out that if you believe that not being in line with god in this very specific way will make your life worse and that maybe even you should blame yourself for something or that you should feel bad about not being in line with God in that specific way, then yeah, of course you're going to feel worse when you're not doing that. Yeah. Because you, guilt. You, you set up that expectation. Yeah. You are going to notice yeah. that you feel bad more because you're expecting mm -hmm. that. And yes, the guilt. You're going to be guilting yourself when you're not in yeah. line. So, of course, getting in line with God in that way is going to alleviate that. But that is all self-imposed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of things that I do now that would have been considered sins when I was a Christian. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't – like. I don't experience any negative effects of them because they're not actually wrong and they're, they're, there aren't any negative outcomes that come from it. Yeah. When I was a Christian was doing the same thing, I felt bad. Yeah. But that was because I felt like I was supposed to feel bad. Right. And so I did, you know? So am I right in thinking that, yes, she believes that there are, you know, genetic predispositions, there are chemical effects there are physical mm -hmm. effects on the brain that can cause mental health issues mm -hmm. and she thinks that a spiritual intervention is the only thing that is really up for remedying that she doesn't think that physical interventions are necessary or or efficacious in that area from what i've gathered through watching a lot of their episodes i think that they would say that like there are physical things that can help like actual tangible things that can help mm -hmm. like medication can help therapy can help but the thing that's ultimately going to cure it what's ultimately what's going to help the best is god i mean not a according to actual evidence right like religion <laughs> yeah. absolutely religion religious community can absolutely yeah. help your mental health but it's not a replacement for evidence-based interventions. It is one part of a healthy lifestyle for people who are in a healthy religious community, yeah. which is not everyone. Yeah. But potentially, yeah, it can be helpful. But Yeah. I mean, and they talk about mental health quite a bit 
because they both have a lot of struggles with mental health, they'll they'll say like, oh, you know, we're not experts on this. And like, maybe one day we'll bring a mental health expert on to talk. But here's things that have worked for us. And here's our advice. Here's our suggestions. And they'll spend the majority of the episode talking about just faith-based methods. Yeah. And they won't really touch on like evidence-based methods at all. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you guys aren't experts. You're not experts. So you shouldn't be coming on here and talking about mental health and giving advice at all. Yeah, this is extremely irresponsible. It's very irresponsible. Like you can be doing permanent damage on people with some of the things that you say because it – just telling people to get right with God and read the Bible is it's not going to work. It's just not. I guess it's good that they acknowledge that they're not experts. Uh, I don't think that excuses what they're saying. No, I don't think so at all. If they did actually bring on someone who specializes in evidence-based approaches to Mm -hmm. achieving better mental health, I think that that person would probably tell them that what they're doing and and the ideas that they're spreading to their followers are potentially very harmful and can get them into almost an addictive, abusive type of of cycle of anxiety. I'll I'll explain that. Mm -hmm. When you have a system for managing anxiety that basically goes, you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to deal with it. But then X, Y, and Z are almost impossibly hard and you will inevitably fail to do that Mm -hmm. all the time, then you'll fail to do that. You'll guilt yourself for not doing X, Y, and Z, and then you'll feel worse. Right. And because you believe X, Y, and Z is the thing that's going to help you, you just hit it even harder. You try to do X, Y, and Z even harder again. You fail again. You Mm -hmm. feel even worse. You try again. You fail again. You feel even worse. And it's a a cycle. It's like an abusive relationship. It's like a vicious cycle that, once you're entered into doesn't ever get you any further than where you were when you started. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty clear when you analyze what they're saying. Yeah. I feel like if they did actually ever bring like on an expert, I doubt it would be really an expert. It would probably be be someone that buys, yeah, a pastor or somebody that buys into all of their like conservative Christian mumbo jumbo. So (laughs) I don't feel like it would be that helpful. Right. Help us. And like we, I just said, he may not heal us overnight, but that doesn't mean that he isn't going to be there to get us through it and to be there. And to, and we don't know why. We're sometimes we we go through brokenness, heartbreak because it's necessary for us to go through that. He's trying to build us. He's trying to build. Even he'll break. He'll he. I know why he brought me through my brokenness because I would have never found him. He needed to get me down so bad so I could find him so I could build relationship with him. Yeah. Yeah, I, that is truly the beauty in being broken, and there is beauty in it, is that you oftentimes, and I see it so much in my own life, how people will resist God for the longest time. They'll put so many different things in front of him, all these idols, all this money, fame, career, all, everything, and then all of a sudden, when they are at the very end of themselves, they come crawling and they say, hey, I don't have anything else. What is this Jesus guy? I really need him. And it's not until life breaks you over its knee that you start crying out to God and um, I'm sorry to say that brokenness to get you to salvation to get you to eternal life in heaven with Jesus I'm so sorry if you're you've been through brokenness but I'm happy that it happened if it brought you to your knees in front of God I'm so glad that it happened to you isn't that so fucked up that's incredibly abusive yeah that's so so abusive I mean can you imagine telling somebody who just lost a child or something like oh i'm so happy that you lost your child because you're a christian now it brought you closer to god like i'm so happy that happened this is what happens in the system where you can count all the hits and you can dismiss all of the misses you can be like well it was actually spiritually beneficial for that kid (laughs) to die yeah yeah you have to somehow like sometimes things just bad things happen just for no good reason yeah you don't need to like try to like put some positive spin on it like sometimes things just suck and that's life. Their God does not come out looking very good from the outside. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly, I used to work in a women and children's shelter. So what that meant was we had women coming in with their kids. 
they were usually escaping an abusive situation and were in need of a place to stay and you know food mm -hmm. shelter and security from their abusive partner the mindset that a lot of them would say that they either had before coming or that they had when they first came to the shelter would be you know i i know i i know i did wrong and, and he was just telling me that i was doing wrong and he I, I deserved that and he was just trying to make it better for me. The only reason why he did this to me is because he was trying to make it better for me. I need to learn. My brokenness is the thing that's going to bring mm -hmm. us through this situation. And it was a Christian homeless shelter, but we, we still would say there's never any excuse yeah. for anyone treating you this way. Yeah. I know that it's been a long time that, you know, this has been going on. This is... It's never the first yeah. time that somebody leaves. It's it's like the seventh or eighth or ninth time that this happens and they fear for their child's life that they actually yeah. come to the shelter. But we say, I know this is not the first time this has happened. It's going to keep happening. Breaking the cycle is the only thing that, that works. You will never, ever, ever deserve the treatment. You did yeah. not, nothing you could do would make you deserve this treatment. And from there... We would treat them with the other people there who were Christian. It was the only non-Christian that worked there. No one knew. <laughs> but we'd treat them with like God's love, with Christ's yeah. love. And that didn't mean telling them that they deserve death and damnation all the time. Yeah. It usually meant being like, hey, here's free food. Here's shelter. Do you want to come like read this book with me? Do you want to be my friend? Just showing them love and showing them they're worthwhile. This is telling people that they should be abused, that God should yeah. punish them, should abuse them. I mean, as society, we do not accept the explanation that, oh, your husband abused you is because he was trying to teach you something. Yeah. We don't accept that as an ex explanation. Right. So why do we accept that as an explanation for God? Isn't God even more loving than any human could possibly be? Shouldn't he be showing us more empathy and more love? Should he not be putting us through hell, basically, in order to teach us a lesson? He couldn't figure out a way to teach us the, thing, the things in life that we need to know through a different means yeah. other than cruelty and torment? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that they would answer, but like the fall, the fall of man, that's why we, you know, have to suffer here on earth and ultimately he wants us to get to heaven that's yeah. that's the point yeah. but i think you see in that answer that this type of system this all-powerful yet completely ununderstandable god who is apparently perfectly loving but can do whatever he wants to you whatever horrible thing mm -hmm. to you and still be called loving this is a tool which practically speaking excuses permits and even encourages complete atrocities oh yeah Definitely. This is not good for people here on earth. This is this is a bad thing. Religion can be good for people. This, this is no. abuse. And I think it, they are right that when people are kind of backed into a corner, when they're really, really down and out and having a hard time, mm -hmm. a lot of the time they do look to spirituality or religion because we're more likely, when we can't find an answer that explains what is happening to us, yeah. we'll clamor at any answer that we can find any reason we can find even if it's not rational yeah we'll still accept that because we're more comfortable with an answer than no answer at all right humans do not do well with uncertainty yeah so it is true that people will come to religion when they're going through a lot of tough things but that doesn't necessarily like make that religion true yeah and also it is the case that when other people see people going through tough situations. They purposely prey on them. That's when they strike. That's when they mm -hmm. try to evangelize to them. Right. Because they know whether or not they really like understand this consciously or not, that that person's in a vulnerable state. Right. And more easily um, influenced. Influenced, yeah. What do you think it says about the truth value of a religion that it can excuse anything bad to make it good? And that people, the more desperate they are, the more likely they are to believe it. I would say that makes it probably like unlikely to be true. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think this makes the religion look bad in every single way. It's wild that from the inside, the psychological effect is actually 
to keep you in. Yeah. Let's get into something a little bit uh, before we go because we've been going for a little bit. We want to talk about soul ties. And soul ties are a bit of a debate within the Christian community because people say that soul ties aren't biblical. And while the Bible doesn't explicitly reference soul tie by that name, I do believe that soul ties are an actual thing. I don't think that it's like a new age thing term that's come out like I I do believe like and if you don't like the term soul ties I would refer to it as like spiritual ties um there is scripture that supports this the bible really quickly let me just say that so a soul tie is a strong spiritual and emotional connection that you have with someone after being intimate with them or you don't even have to be intimate with them and you can have the same type of soul tie. Um, I want to read the scripture that supports this. So the Bible warns against entering ungodly relationships. He says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. Do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. Proverbs 1, 10 and 15. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 16, it says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So I'm kind of wondering if you were taught of the about the concept of soul ties, because yeah. in my case, I never heard anyone refer to it as soul ties. I wasn't like taught about that directly, but I was definitely taught that if you're intimate or have sex with somebody you're not married, that it binds you two together yeah. emotionally or spiritually. And it can be really difficult to like untangle that. And you're like, yeah. that person kind of has like a piece of you uh, forever. Yeah. And I don't know, like, were you taught, like, did you hear about soul ties growing up? Soul ties was not the, the term, but I was taught about that exact thing. Mm-hmm. And that exact scripture was used to, to back that up. Yes, I was actually very, very afraid of of having sex outside of marriage. I mean, like physically afraid because I would, I was told that if I did that, I would permanently irreversibly damage myself Mm -hmm. and that no amount of work, no amount of repentance, nothing would ever make me whole again. I was told Mm. that a part of my soul was physically knit together. There's some spiritual substance in me that was knit together like this. And what happened when you broke that is that, you know, you have this bond and it's basically cut. And so bits, I mean, literally parts of the soul Hmm. cling on to the other person's soul. And so I was like, I will be permanently disfigured and I will always be in pain for the rest of my life if I ever do this. interesting. I wasn't like taught that extreme. It sounds like it was a lot more like aggressive what you were taught because I, I was taught that like, you would be bonded together and like your souls would be like intertwined basically. But that if you repented, like after a while you could be made whole again. It, I wasn't taught that like yeah. you were permanently not whole, you know? Yeah. So I find that like interesting. Also, I do want to mention and we'll kind of like touch on it again in a little bit, but she, you know, said that when you have sex, this happens, but also you can have this happen. You can have a soul tie with somebody even if you don't have sex. Yeah. So that's something that like we can address after the whole clip's over. They also talk about in scripture about like knitting of souls, like two souls becoming one by knitting together between Jonathan and David. In 1 Samuel 18, 1, it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. But the godly soul tie there's only one godly soul tie two one we're soul tied with god our spirits are tied with his and then the other godly positive good soul tie is in marriage yeah therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh god uses intimacy in marriage to serve god as one now we're going to touch on something that's a little bit whatever but we talk about everything on girls gone bible the truth is that God did create sex to be preserved in the context of marriage. That is the truth, whether people like it or not, whether we want to agree with it or not, that's what it is. God isn't withholding good things from us. He actually created sex to be one of the most beautiful parts about life. 
it's actually so sacred that the enemy has perverted it so hard because he wants to destroy anything that God makes as sacred as sex. Yeah, yeah. You know, and God doesn't withhold it to be mean to us. He 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 tells us not to he, to abstain because it leads to death. It leads to demonic oppression. It leads to g demonic soul ties. It leads to all of these things that you can't demonstrate. This whole system that has no direct evidence, no way to test in any way, mm -hmm. leads to results that you also can't observe in any way either. <laughs> kind of sounds like a narrative you can weave in order to make anything true or false, right? Yeah, and the whole demonic oppression thing, like I, I definitely was not taught about that. Demonic and like, soul ties, what? Yeah, like source for that? Yeah, like, I don't know. Where, where does that come from? <laughs> and every time that you are intimate with somebody, your soul binds with theirs, whether you want to accept it or not. And it's really, really freaky. And I would describe it almost as being, and this is a part of Christianity that a lot of people shy away from because it's it's too spiritual for some people, but I really believe that denying the spirituality in Christianity is truly denying Jesus. Because if God raised if God's spirit raised Jesus from the dead, how much more spiritual do you want to get? Like we live in a spiritual world where spiritual beings and this stuff is real. I believe that when you're intimate with somebody, it's like a USB stick going into a kid. Like whatever <laughs> they got in them is about to come onto you demon-wise. So <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow. When the penis enters the vagina, yeah. a literal demon splurts out. It, it comes on to you, demon-wise. <laughs> uh, isn't that wild? That is that is Girls Gone Bible. Oh, that Jesus. is Girls Gone Bible. It's Girls Gone Bible and Gone Wild. Um, But I, I do find it so interesting because she, you know, this whole entire, like her whole entire premise is that you shouldn't have sex with somebody because you're going to have a soul tie with them yeah. so, so so you should abstain you should never have sex yeah until you're married but then she also at the beginning said like you can't have a soul tie with somebody even if you're you don't have sex with them mm -hmm. but they're not suggesting never date they're not suggesting to never get into romantic relationships yeah so shouldn't they shouldn't it logically follow then that they should be teaching their followers to like only court or like not get romantically involved in, with somebody until you're basically marrying them because you could potentially have a soul tie with them right. and you could get like demons all over you. And yeah. Stuff. Yes and no. Yes in the way that if you really try to enter their their mindset here as you're doing that could be a you know a logical consequence or a logical progression of of their thought you know they should be doing this yeah but also i think that all of this spiritual mumbo jumbo that they are saying are just mechanisms by which they can justify beliefs that they have regardless right you know right. i think that they pick up certain ideas about sex and culture and a lot of different things from their social in-group of Christians. And then the social in-group of Christians teaches them, hey, you can use all of this narrative structuring, this narrative framework of the spiritual in order to back up all of these things that don't have any real proof for them. And you can even elevate the importance of all the things you're saying into the transcendent by invoking the spiritual rather than saying, well, if you look at what follows this behavior, you know, that's bad and we want to avoid that. Yeah, I, I do think that they're right that sex can be an emotional thing. You can yeah. definitely kind of get, in, I guess, emotionally entangled with somebody that can happen. And I, I do feel like there is kind of this sentiment in the atheist community that just sex with anybody and everybody is totally okay and it's never gonna have any consequences for you emotionally yeah. you should just be able to do that and i don't buy into that at all right. i think for a lot of people it is an emotional thing it is a bonding thing yeah but also there are instances where casual sex can be non-emotional there are yeah. cases where that can be a thing i think it just or at least not harmful yeah yeah, yeah. I think it just, it works differently for different people and like, that's okay. Yeah. Again, they are invoking something spiritual in order to explain something that 
is explainable through natural means. There is a lot of brain chemistry that goes on that's really crazy when you have sex, when you do a lot of different things. But when mm -hmm. you have sex, certain chemicals are released in your brain and they have to do with promoting behaviors that make you bond to people. They give you feelings. They form kind of new neural connections that Help make... with cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. They, they bond you together with that person. And that is a physical phenomenon that we yeah. can actually observe if we care about observing that. No, you're wrong. You're jizzing out demons. Just a minute. <laughs> yeah. I'll come on to you demonically. <laughs> I am interested to hear what you have to say about whether or not this is a grift. What do you think? Do you have an opinion about it? It's hard for me to say because I don't know about it as much as mm -hmm. you do. So i i would just reserve judgment based on what i've seen i don't okay. feel like it's enough i could imagine a scenario where these are two actresses that realize there is a lot of money to be made in really really low quality christian content mm -hmm. that's possible i could also totally believe that they are extremely confused and super uneducated about these things and also are completely fine like most christians are with exploiting the spiritual in order to make as much money as possible yeah um it's open-ended for me i'm interested to just see what you have yeah. said <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's address whether or not i think this podcast is a grift um i'll just cut to the chase I don't think it is. I think that Angela and Ari are genuine about their faith. Both of them use a lot of Christian insider lingo, and especially Angela demonstrate that they have at least more than a surface level understanding of the Bible. I don't think that this would be possible unless they were pretty enmeshed with a Christian community. However, I think that Angela and Ari, above anything else, are influencers. Given that they're both actresses and are more comfortable in front of the camera than most, starting a Christian podcast was probably a natural way for them to generate another income source. I also think that the name Girls Gone Bible was carefully chosen for its risque connotations. Two beautiful white actresses reading the Bible together on a podcast named after softcore porn sounds like every conservative man's dream. I think in the age of social media, we're seeing an interesting collision of the world of the influencer with the world of evangelical Christianity. I think in many ways, these two worlds clash more than they go together. This is why, despite creating a podcast geared towards evangelicals, Angela and Ari still post pictures of themselves in revealing outfits to Instagram, something that would shock many evangelicals. This is why, despite Jesus's disdain for the greedy, so-called Christian influencers, <laughs> Ashley Hetherington will use scripture as justification for why their followers need to buy their products. The influencer world is concerned with drawing attention to the influencer through likes and engagement. When people try to tie in Christianity, a religion that teaches its followers to die to self, to this world of the influencer, they open this portal to a universe full of contradictions. As we've seen, Angela and Ari push some pretty harmful ideas on their podcast, so I'll definitely be reacting to them again in the future, and I really hope you guys are up for that. <laughs> thank you so much for watching, and a huge thank you to my patrons who helped make these videos possible. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my Instagram is taylor underscore the underscore antibot. If you'd like to support this channel financially, a link to my Patreon will be down in the description, and we'll see you all in the next one. Say bye! <laughs>